out there. But uh, I believe this is the sixth year uh, I've been coming here with my wife and I've been married now for uh, going to be five years in December, to December 11th, and that's a blessing. I uh, got, got the good thing out of Kokomo, my wife, and then ran back to New Mexico. So, uh, but thank you guys for your prayers. It has been such a blessing, uh, just the friendship that we've gotten to have over the last couple of years here. And just to see the new faces in the church, that's so exciting, like I said this morning. And so we're looking forward to what God's going to do this month. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, together. But if you would be praying for me, uh, and Mikey, we're heading up on Tuesday morning, dropping them off for college. And then I'm hightailing down to the Queen, Arkansas. Um, you say where that is? I have no clue either, so we'll have to figure that out. Um, I'll be actually preaching and teaching for uh, Thursday, Friday night, and then Saturday morning on uh, soul winning, and just trying to get the church excited about soul winning, trying to get out knocking doors. Uh, the pastor that was there took over about a year and a half ago, and they have a whole lot of people, and just nobody was really uh, emphasized, had any real heart or, or bird to go soul winning. And so I tried to get my pastor to come out there because my pastor was great teaching on soul and whatnot. And he said, well, we'll have you. I said, well, okay, we'll, trip, we'll go through like the third string here. But uh, <laughs> so pray for me if you look about that. Get excited about what the Lord will do there for that church. And he's a good pastor. He just needs some church members to get on fire for God to reach souls. And let me just say that's what every pastor needs, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that's because that's what God commands for everybody to be. Okay, on fire for souls, looking for the lost, all right? But if you would be praying for me about that, uh, as I was saying just a few moments ago, my, I got married my wife, and we're, uh, we took her out here, and now we've got two little girls, and uh, they're both stubborn like the mom, and the grandmother, and the great-grandmother, all of which are right here tonight as well, so, and maybe their aunts as well, but we'll have to see about that. But I, just with marriage, and we're having our uh, couples retreat come up here in uh, about two weeks of September, and just reading some marriage books, making sure I'm all good to go so I don't get convicted during the marriage retreat time. <laughs> My husband got everything under control. I came across this little uh, joke about marriage, and uh, this husband and wife were talking, and, and then uh, wound up that the wife got in a car accident. And as these two men were walking to work, he goes, uh, one friend was talking to another friend, and he said, Well, I already got into another fender better this morning. And he goes, Was there a lot of damage? Only to our marriage, he says, oh, because you got bent out of shape, huh? So we get sometimes bent out of shape. We're the silliest thing sometimes, right? But praise the Lord for a good marriage. And by that, I got the best thing out of Indiana. So I'm excited about that. But um, John chapter number two, okay? John chapter number two. And we are I'm going to look at something here that I believe will be a help and a challenge for us this evening. Uh, but I also believe that it's going to be convicting. So we'll just get ready for that. Just open your heart to the Lord. Uh, just ask God to, to work and deep in your life tonight. And I believe it's going to be help for us and again a challenge for this month ahead for you guys. I'm excited about uh, the emphasis that you have uh, for soul winning. And just to say this, there is no greater purpose in life than to be a soul winner. Tell other right. people how they, how, they, how they can know for sure they're going to heaven with God. So John chapter number 2. John chapter number 2, we're going to start at verse number 1. John chapter 2, verse number 1, very famous passage, I'm sure, uh, and we should all know. We're going to read down to about verse number 12. So John chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, In the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus, uh, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servant, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Uh, just to say this, if Jesus tells you to do something, it would be good for you to do it. Amen? Verse number 6, And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner, manner of the purifying of the Jews, contained two and or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear it unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted of the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegrooms, and saith unto them, uh, unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunken, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. 
This beginning of the miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifest forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Let's stop right there. Father, we ask you to have bless, and I pray that you lead and guide uh, in the next few moments, Lord. Father, you know my heart, and you know that I pray much over what you want me to do today. I laid out several sermons in front of me this morning, laid it out before you, and just ask you what you want me to do. But Father, I spent a few. Uh, good while trying to prepare for this tonight. God, I pray now that you'd help us and lead us and guide us in the next few moments. I pray, Lord, that the message, the thought that will be delivered with the great spirit, also received with the great spirit as well. And Father, I pray that you would lead us and just show us exactly what to do. And Father, I pray that you help us to respond biblically to the challenge that's set before us tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Uh, several of us remember the story, and I was not born yet, so it wouldn't be me, but uh, the miracle on ice was really uh, something that was the craze and really exciting time during the Mel Brown ice hockey uh, game here in the 1980 Winter Olympics. Uh, the United States national team was made up of amateur players, and they wound up defeating the Soviet Union, praise God for that, uh, <laughs> national team, which had won the gold medal in the out, six out of the seven previous years of the Olympic Games, okay? So uh, the Soviet Union was really the team to beat. Uh, the Team USA went on to win the gold medal by winning its last match over Finland, and the Soviet Union took silver by beating uh, Sweden in its last and final game. Now listen to this. In 1999, Sports Illustrated, the Miracle on Ice, the top sports moment in the 20th century. As a part of its 100th year anniversary celebration in 2008, the International Ice Hockey Foundation chose the Miracle on Ice as the century number one international ice hockey story. Pretty crazy, right? With a capacity of 8,500, the field house was packed to the brim. The home crowd was waving uh, United States flags and singing, pat singing patriotic songs of God Bless America. It didn't really offend too many people back then. Mm -hmm. Just a little thought there, okay? And it would be good if we didn't get offended over our flag that stands for the home of the free, right? Because of the break. So thank God for America. Amen. Uh, but the crowd was buzzing. It was exciting. They were, seeing, they were saying USA, USA. It was really a tough match. Uh, the Soviets were ahead for most of the game. And then towards the, about the last 10 minutes of the game or so, uh, Team USA finally got ahead. And it, uh, the, uh, the, the Soviet Union, for the first time trailing in the game, uh, started really to panic. And one of their top players really started, started saying, we were just freaking out. We were scared. We didn't know what to do. And so we started to panic. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the uh, United States team just started playing as best they could, continuing going forward, uh, trying to put the puck across the blue line there to clear the zone. Uh, and even was able to get off a few more shots towards the goal. Uh, with just a few seconds less uh, remaining on, this, uh, on, the, on the scoreboard there, uh, 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 what's his name? Al Michaels delivered his famous call and said, we got 11 seconds. We've got 10 seconds. We've now, the countdown is going right now. We've got five seconds. And he went four and three and then two. And he asked this question, do you believe in miracles? <laughs> do you believe in miracles? And then he answered his own question by saying, Yes, okay? And I want to tell you, I believe in miracles tonight, okay? Mm -hmm. And listen, I believe it was a miracle of God for the United States team to beat the Soviet Union pretty close, okay? But I don't believe that that was a miracle of God, okay? I believe God working in God's people's lives are the miracles for today. And listen, just like God worked in the Old Testament for miracles and worked on the hearts and lives of people and did some great things for the children of Israel, I believe that God still wants to do miracles for us today. And God wants to help us to do miraculous things through His power Amen. and through His might. Right. Gideon proposed a question, do, uh, where be all the miracles? And I want to say, the miracles are available to you and I if we're willing to take a step of faith. Just like those people did. Right. Listen, we have the same God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just like they had in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were stuck between uh, a rock and a hard place. Amen. They had the Red Sea before them. They had two sharp mountains beside them. And then the Egyptian army was coming behind them. And the children of Israel started to murmur and complain and said, Moses, did you, why did you bring us out into the wilderness to be killed? Wasn't there enough graves in Egypt? And Moses said, said stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And what did God do that day? He provided a miracle and worked up work on the behalf of his people and the Bible says he made the water to congeal and the children of Israel walked across the water 
on dry ground. God provided a miracle, right? The three Hebrew boys, what happened to them? They got thrown in the fire, right? Why? Because they said, man, we're not going to bow down to your idol. It's not going to happen. Our God is able to deliver us. Yes, he is. But if not, if he's not going to, we're still not going to bow down. And we find out, guess what? There's a fourth man in the fire, right? That's right. And the Bible says that, that uh, they had no hurt. The Bible says the only thing that was that was burned off of them was the very thing that those soldiers binded around them. The Bible says that the smell of smoke didn't even pass on them. And man, they said, what happened here? The fourth man showed up. And God worked Praise a miracle, Lord. right? God did something special. God did miraculous things. Joshua and his men were fighting in an intense battle at the time, and they were just beating the tar out of them, right? And they said, we need to finish this battle. And Joshua says, son, stand now still. And what happened to the son? Stood still just like that, right? Where be all the miracles? Now listen, God needs to work. Well, I believe some of us tonight need God to work a miracle in our life. So there some, are some struggles and things. Some of us are going through some difficulties. Some of us are going through some hardship. And we don't like it when we hear the, the, the we don't like it when we're in, put in a position that we need God to do a miracle or we don't know what we're going to do. We don't like being in that position, but it is the best place for us to be. To be in a position where we need God to work a miracle. So I want to preach a little bit on this thought, the makings of a miracle. The makings of a miracle. If you would look down at verse number uh, 3, if you would, the Bible says, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, They have no wine. They have no wine. So the first thought I want to give you tonight is the need of a miracle. The need of a miracle. Now, I just told you that I got married five years ago, and it's going to be the only time I get married by the grace of God, because I just can't put up with this stuff anymore, okay? But I remember when Cal was down in Arkansas, where we were getting married there in Malvern, Arkansas, I remember her going through all the preparations, getting the food together, making sure her, her dress fits, and her sister's dress fits, which kind of were going like this at the time, so it was really difficult for her to get everything to fit. And they both were just trying to get the clothing lined out with the food and the water. And I, I, the best thing that I learned was, I'm not going to do anything about that. I'm just going to step away from that. I'm going to let her handle everything. And if she tells me to go to Walmart, I'm going to Walmart. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to handle any details. But one of the scariest things that you can do in preparing something like that in an event is running out of food or drinks. This poor couple, that's exactly what happened to them. More people, people get a little bit excited, so they're drinking a whole lot. I don't know exactly, okay? But come to find out, they didn't have exactly what they needed. And Jesus says, we have no one. We don't have exactly what we need. And they were in the jam, were they not? Now, here's what I want you to learn from this. Sometimes, I need, when we need a miracle, a miracle is unexpected. When we need God to show up, it's unexpected. We didn't plan for it. It, didn't, it wasn't going according to our plan or anything like that. And when we needed God to do something, when we needed to, uh, we thought everything was going great, everything was going fine, and then out there, we needed a miracle. We needed God to show up. We needed God to do something on our behalf. And listen, I know there's never a good time to get bad news. Right. There's never a good time, like my father, who's terminally ill and has been for four years now, there's never a good day when it says, hey, you're going to die of a form of cancer. There's never a good day, day to get the call and say, hey, your son just got killed in a car accident like somebody happened in our church not too long ago. There's never a good day to hear those, those drastic things that happen in our life. There's never a good day to hear those bad news. But some of us have had some of that. Some of us have gone through situations like Some of us have gone through a lot of hardship and a lot of heartache, and we need God to show up. We need God to do something for us. But you also want to know something else about a miracle? Yeah, a miracle comes at an unexpected time and we don't really expect it, but the need of a miracle is also sometimes stressful. Look at verse number 4. Jesus says unto her, her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour has not come. By no means mocking for little in Jesus, but I believe that gives us a good idea of we've all asked this question, what do you want me to do about it? What can I do? How am I going to take care of this? 
And I know I've been there, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, where we maybe don't have as much money for rent as we need to, and we get asked, we get the question, what are you going to do? And you go, what am I going to do about this? How can I, ch it's due tomorrow, how am I going to be able to handle anything? But sometimes it gets a little stressful. Because life is stressful, right? It gets a little scary. You don't really know what to do. You don't really know what, what is possible. So the need of a miracle really comes at an unexpected time, but also sometimes it gets really stressful. And the reason why it gets stressful is because we start depending on our self rather than God Almighty. Right. And so when we start to figure out everything out by ourselves and try to figure out how we're going to make this work and how we're going to get the money, can we call mom and borrow the money? Can we do this and try to get the money for right or maybe, uh, Are we going to be able to pull, work out this way? What? When we start to try to figure things out by ourselves, listen, it's very stressful very quickly, but it's because we're not resting on the one that can take care of everything for us. The Bible says, trust the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. What that simply means is don't try to figure it out yourself. In all thy ways, do what? Acknowledge him. What do you think about this? What would you do about this? God, what would you do in my situation? And the Bible gives us a great, wonderful promise. What? He shall direct our path. God will take care of God will show the way. God will perform a miracle. God will work on our half, the half. But I want to say this. A need of a miracle, the need of a miracle is unexpected. It is stressful, but also the need of a miracle, it only can be really defined as a miracle is if it's humanly impossible. Right? <laughs> It's humanly impossible. I know this has happened for me in my life, and thank God for a praying wife and a praying family that we have together. Uh, I know that this has happened for us, but we don't exactly know where all the money is going to come from, uh, come from for rent and things like that. And just to say this, God takes care of you every step of the time. And then we don't really know what's going to happen, but when you acknowledge the God of heaven, God will take care of you. God will show up. And God's provided for us more and more and more than we ever thought was possible. And God took care of us more and more than we ever thought was even, uh, <clears throat> we ever thought it was something that God would do for us. But man, God just showed up for us. And God took care of us. And God's helped us every step of the way. Praise and if you, know, if you know my daughters, man, they're a, they're a headache. Again, they're like their mom and grandma. So, and, and all that. But I want you to understand that a miracle is possible when the impossible is the only option. When you say all of that can happen, the only way that this will work out is if God does something. That's when a miracle is possible. When we say that the only way that this will work out is if God does something, if God shows up, that's the only way this is going to happen. And when it's humanly impossible, we can't explain it. We don't know how this worked out. We don't know why this was possible. It's only because of God. Only because God showed up for us. But I want you to notice this, and this is where we spend most of our time, and that is the instruction for a miracle. The instruction for a miracle. Look at verse number 7, if you would, and verse number 8. Verse number 7, and also verse number 8. Jesus saved unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saved unto them, draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear them. Now the instructions... Of a miracle. Jesus gave them clear direction of what to do. Okay, so what I want you to do, guys, is go fill the water, these water pots here, fill it with water. And then after you fill it with water, I want you to take it to the governor. Now let me ask you a question. The governors, and most governors, do they like water or do they like wine? <laughs> so what did this guy want? Did he want water or did he want wine? Wine. He wanted wine. So Jesus says, hey guys, what I want you to do, I want you to fill this up with Water. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? God says, This is what I want you to do. You simply just listen to me. I'll take care of the rest. I'll, I will handle everything about, you know, going door to door. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Why can't we just put a message, message on Facebook and invite everybody? Why can't we just blow a horn and have everybody show up? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why can't, why? This doesn't seem like it's. That effect. But God may not be right. Man, God's ways may be strange, but they are effective. And God said, so what I want you to do is I want you to take these water pots, fill them with water, and then bear it to the bear it to the government. And that's what I want you to do. He said it doesn't make sense. But listen, it doesn't need to make sense. All we need to do is do it. 
All we need to do is obey the command. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I understand that. Now everything in the Bible does make sense, but it's a command, and if we obey it, God will teach us along the way. Right. Man, we might not understand why uh, <clears throat> why God showed, told us to do certain things in the Bible, but after we do it by faith and just trust God that God will do the results of what we said we will obey and God will take care of the rest, man, God shows up in a miraculous way. It doesn't make sense, and we use this as illustration all the time, right? It doesn't make sense how God expects us to give 10% of our money and then God somehow makes it stretch beyond the full hundred if we would catch it, right? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that way. But as soon as you do it, what happens? God always blesses, right? I'm glad right, right before Callie and I got married, uh, we were at a church in Melbourne, Arkansas, and we were listening to a guy named, uh, a guy uh, teach on finances and just how uh, to give properly for tithe, and that's kind of a no brainer there. But Rose talked a little bit about missions and how to give faithfully to missions. And what he said is when you're doing your faith promise mission, what you do is you give the, the church a hard number, $25, let's say. And what you do on your side is you turn it into a percentage. Okay, so $25 is percentage of what? Of your monthly income. And every time you get, you get any money, you give your 10% to your tithe, and then you give your certain percent to missions. And man, that's stuck with Callie and I. We've been doing it ever since then. And it, it doesn't, it, it is a trip Amen. to see how God takes care of us. Right yeah. now, I'm not trying to, trying to boast or anything like that or say anything, but our monthly income through support is only about $1,100 a month. Okay? How and I at this time give about 40% to the Lord between high missions and also a building program at our church. I don't know how it works out, but every month of the world, God takes care of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does not make sense. I'm going to get audited like that. I know it's going to happen. <laughs> it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but God takes care of us. Why? How does it work if I give money, I get money? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But God gives us the direction, and all we need to do is what? Obey. And we, it takes a step of faith. It takes something that we don't really understand, but direction was given, but then it is expressed by faith. So these guys, what do they do? They said, Jesus said, get this water. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're going to get this water. We're going to take it over to the governor. And we're going to get laughed at because this governor over here, he's kind of a bigwig. He likes wine. So we're going to do this. We're going to get mocked and ridiculed. And he takes over there. And what happens? From point A to point B, God showed up. Right? God miraculously somehow turned that water into wine for those people, and God did something great. You know what? God gives us the clear direction, and all we need to do is step out by faith. It says, Jesus said, filled up, and then it says, they filled it up. And then it says, embarrassed the governor, and what did they do? They bore it to the governor. And I want to say, God still wants to do a miracle for us, okay? Amen. But for God, to, for God to be able to do a miracle on our side, what we need to do is listen to the instruction Amen. and then do it by faith. Amen. Listen to what God told us to do. We have a Bible. It's not like we have to Google search it all over the place for it. God said, this is what I want you to do. So listen to me, and God will perform a miracle. God will show up. God will do something for us in a very special way. Now listen, again, going door to door and saying, hey, I'm from Faith Baptist Church in Kokomo. I'd like to give you an invite to my church. doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's why there's churches all in this area. I think you said Copper Point or Crown uh, Crossing Road or something like that this morning. That is not, is not a reaching church by any means. They're a tracking church. They, they, have the, they have the bands. They have the cute little Kool-Aid. They have the Xbox games for the kids to just purely attract, attract them. And that's all they do at those churches for the kids. That's it. And most of the time, only for the adults, adults too. They have an hour worth of rock music and rap music, Christian. They have a five little, little devotional thing that I would not even do, give my daughter. And they call that church. Right. They, they come in, lost as a goose or horse race, and they go out the very same way. 
I have a friend, I get, uh, a friend uh, uh, Mickey Hollers, he's a pastor in Ada, Oklahoma. He was on, he was, he had a friend, uh, why he was in, before he went to Ada, he was in uh, Fort Worth, a pastor, 20 years, grew churches, uh, 450 people, faithful soul. And one day he was knocking on the door and he went to, uh, ran into a guy that he knew several years before that went to a different church. He started talking to him and he goes to a Protestant church and uh, started asking some questions and he said, man, uh, so you know this, right? He said, yeah. He said, does your church ever preach about the gospel and how to get saved and all that? He said, no, never. He said, where, where do your people go to get saved? He said, we go to the Baptist church. <laughs> we go to the Baptist church. Why? Because the Baptists emphasize going with the gospel. Telling people how to get saved. Listen, all it comes down to this. What did God tell us to do? And then simply by faith step out and do it. Listen, we can go soul in anywhere. We can tell people how to get saved anywhere. I mentioned this morning uh, when Brother Green had to give a test point. We left Friday morning early, about 7 o'clock or so, um, and started driving up here. We got to Eden, Oklahoma. And there was this nice guy there named William. And, and he was just sitting there, and he was kind of looking at me, and I was looking at him while we were filling up the gas. And he, he didn't look like a bum, but he, he obviously knew that he was not a guy that had a place to live and everything like that. So I go into the store there, and I get some, some cash back because we're about ready to go through the tolls and all that, so we needed some money. Come out, go around, and I give him a fly gospel track, and I say, hey, man, I just want to give this to you and just let you see this. I sit down by, sit it down right next to him and start talking to him and start playing out. He did two tours in, in Iraq and uh, lost his son in a car accident. Eight year old son about two years ago uh, got in an accident with his grandmother and the, the, the boy perished just like that. Sad story. Yeah. He was working at, I believe it was the horse race track there in Eden. Lost his job about two weeks ago. And it's just started getting back, back and forth, starting to know, getting to know him. Then I asked him another question that I had toward you guys this morning. I always ask. I said, if you were a sample for Jesus, he said, why should I let you in heaven? What would you say? And he said, well, I don't know what I would say. I think he's going to be able to go because I'm a good person and I worship you. I said, man, that's great. That, that's great. The reason why I asked it this way is because we know, one, that we're all going to stand before Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are going to give an account for our life. And the reason why I ask it that way is because we understand if we don't have the answer that Jesus Christ is looking for, we're not going to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. And the simple, answer, the simple answer to that question is I trust Jesus Christ as my personal Savior plus nothing, minus nothing. That's it. And so I started giving the gospel about 10 or 5, 10 minutes later. He got saved. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell the, I told that story this, this morning. I didn't tell the story, this story this morning either, but uh, on Friday night, I was talking to a lady in Ashley. We got to Joplin, Missouri. She was a clerk at the front there at Quality Inn. Going there, they all checked in. I'm going out and I said, why did I even give her a track? Went back to the car to get my stuff. I said, why did I even give her a track? Walked back in there and Mike was with me and I gave him one, one of the church tracks that I used for the jail ministry that has a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross, all this I did for thee. I started talking to her a little bit, asked her where she's from. Come to find she's from Hobbs, New Mexico. It's about three hours from where I live. They have, have a big prison down there. And I just started talking to her. Come find out she's Pentecostal. And she's been living in Joplin for like eight years and hasn't found a church. And I said, you probably haven't really been looking too much, have you? She's like, no, not really. She's living with a guy. And I said, listen, the reason why I give this, why I give this to you is I want you to read it and know I can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. I said, is that something you know for sure? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? She said, well, when I was back in Hobbs, I, I, uh, I got baptized and all that. I said, okay, let me ask it this way. I said, if you're a stand before Jesus, I said, hey, why should I let you to heaven? What would you say? She just gave kind of the same answer. I said, well, the reason why I asked it that way is because if we don't have the answer, we know we're not going to heaven, right? She said, yeah, that makes sense. I said, well, let me show you. I pulled out my little New Testament. And I said, let me show you from the Bible how you can know for sure. This was 9 o'clock at night. Nobody was coming in. It took about another 5 or 10 minutes to let her cry some fire. All we have to do is go and present. God takes care of the rest. Right. Salvation, people being born again, is a miracle. It's right. a miracle of the moment. God changes somebody's life, eternal life, just like that. All we have to do is allow them to get confronted with the gospel. 
You say, well, I don't, I don't believe people can get saved just that simply or just that easily. It, it, we, they have to go through a, a program, and then they have, to, they have to allow the seed to be put into their life, and then to slowly grow, and then maybe after several months, they can finally get saved. Listen, you don't know who, was working, who told Ashley how she would go to heaven when she was a kid. You don't know grandma for Ashley was praying for her to be saved for years before you know. Our job is not to question, did they mean it? Or did they really did they really mean it from their heart? Our job is simply to make a very clear presentation of the gospel. This is how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Listen, you're a lost sinner. What does that mean? That means you've fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, the Bible says you deserve to die. And specifically, die and go to hell, right? Death and hell will cast the lake of fire. This is the second death. But thanks be to God, Jesus loved you and me so much that died on the cross for me and for you so we don't have to go to hell. We don't have to suffer our sins. Jesus already did that for us. Amen. He died on the cross and the Bible says that he was buried and rose again the third day. We have to just take the time to show them very clearly from the gospel, from the Bible, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how they can go to heaven. The Bible says with the heart, man will be within the righteousness and with not confession made unto Salvation. Listen, we, we don't have to we don't have to put these steps into it and say so we gotta do this and do this. We, we just gotta give them the gospel and they have to make that heartfelt decision. Like you said this morning, it's not a mental mental ascent or an intellectual asceticism. It's with the heart man believers of the righteousness, right? The Bible says it's thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in the heart, thou shalt that Jesus Christ raised from the grave, day, thou shalt be saved. saved. And man, the moment that you start questioning, uh, did they mean it? Or did they really understand? Or did they always get it? And I understand those feelings because sometimes you're just talking to somebody and you're kind of like, I don't know if I should really continue on here because I don't know if they're getting there or whatever. I understand. I've been there. I'm trying to be extremely careful as I can and all that. But I want to say this. Our job is simply to give them the gospel and help them to understand that they're going to die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. And then they can, by faith, in a moment of time, accept the miracle of salvation and get born again. Now let me ask you a question. Are you going to be part of that type of a miracle this month? Are you going to be a part of a miracle where God allows you? Hey, look here now. God's going to, are you going to allow God to be a part of you? You, you getting to see people say this month. Are you going to allow God to use you to see that miracle? This month. Listen, guys, I, I I understand that. I understand that not everybody's going to get saved. I wish it was. I wish everybody I talked to would get born again. I wish it would. But ultimately, our responsibility is simply to go with the gospel and tell them how they can know for sure that they're going to heaven when they die. A lot of you guys have probably heard of <clears throat> William Carey and uh, heard some stories about him and know some things about, about William Carey. Uh, William Carey grew up in a Church of England home. Uh, 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 the Church of England, that type of a church, basically a Catholic church is all it comes down to pretty much. Grew up in the Church of England uh, as a religious preacher and all that. Started to become a friend with a, with a guy named John. John was a dissenter in what that simply meant in the Church of If you were either you were in Church of England or you were a dissenter, a.k.a. <clears throat> John and him would just go back and forth on religious talk all the time about the Bible and everything like that. And William Carey said, I, I don't believe that you're right. I don't think you're right. I think the Church of England was the right church. And on and on, he went back and forth. William Carey became a Baptist. The reason why he became a Baptist was actually because of the Revolutionary War. He found out, saw the control that the Church of England had on all the people and how it was just manipulative and all that. And he said, well, I, I think it's completely wrong. wrong. He goes, to, goes with John to that Baptist church, gets baptized. And I believe he was already saved as a young man. gets baptized and becomes a Baptist. He's reading his Bible. He gets convicted over the thought, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And that just really consumed him. And so what he started doing, started preaching a little bit about it, and they had their kind of Baptist fellowship meeting, kind of like what we do today, but I like ours a lot better because we don't just talk about theological ideas, we just preach the Bible at our meetings, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they were having their big theological talk, and 
Uh, he said, I wonder if any of the young, young preachers would like to ask the question of us doctrinal theologians and basically how it comes across. And so William Carey stands up and he says, I want to ask what we're going to do concerning worldwide evangelism. And the kind of like the president of their little Baptist man gave him a startling look and he said, there's an ignorant man that believes that God has to use men to evangelize the heathen. They fell into a Calvinistic type of thinking. I'm not a Calvinist, not one ounce of my body. I, I despise Calvinists. William Carey just sat down, kind of embarrassed a little bit. We resolved in my heart, his heart said, I know this is what God wants us to do. So he goes back to his church, starts preaching about going all the world, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, preaching about it for six or seven years. And finally, wrote a book about it called The Inquiry, about going with the gospel all around the world. And then finally gets to preach on a preacher's meeting type of a deal. And he preached his famous sermon with that last little tagline on there on his invitation. Attempt great things for, for God and expect great things from God. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, God used that sermon to work in people's hearts. And those pastors, about six of them, kind of came over onto the right side about going soul and going with the gospel. And because of that, William Carey was the first man to go to India, labored in India for six or seven years, not even seen one person saved for those six or seven years, but just faithfully giving the gospel, faithfully giving the gospel, faithfully giving the gospel. After six or seven years, finally I see somebody saved, and now it's just a breaking point. Man, it seemed like everybody was getting saved now. Everybody was carrying the gospel and getting born again. And it was just such an exciting time. <clears throat> the reason why I tell that story is because he set out, he said this, what we're going to do is attempt great things for God, and we're going to expect great things from Him. You know, this, this month, what we need to do? We're just going to attempt something great for God. And that is just to see as many people added to the church as we possibly can. We're going to go with the gospel. We're going to tell everybody that we can. We're going to show them how they can know for sure they get, get saved and how they can know for sure they're going to heaven. And if they accept, praise the Lord. If they reject, pray that they can, we can come around another time. And come around another time just continually faithfully telling them what the gospel is. Listen, not everybody's going to get saved the first time. I just heard a man give a testimony. I think his name was Brother Mark, I believe it is what it was. Uh, he went and visited a Buddhist 112 times before the Buddhist got saved. It took him 30 years to win this guy to divorce. 30 years. He said, I hope it doesn't take 30 years. I don't either. But are we willing to? That's, yeah, that's the case, right? Man, the 10 great things for God. And we don't know what God might do. Now listen, guys, I'm not, I'm not a numbers person. I like names. I like to know the people that I got to talk to in the jail. Uh, when we're done, I, if everybody that says, "Yeah, we got saved, we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ," I always, I always have them come up and put their first last name up so I have names. I don't care about numbers. I care about names. I care about the people. And so, what well, I, I just purposely decided to do, I said, "Listen, I, I've been begging, and asking God. I said, God, I just want to see as many people saved as I possibly can. I just want to see people saved. That's all I want to do. Is I want to know nothing of them except." Christ crucified, Christ preached, Christ, Christ, are they saved? And so, <clears throat> uh, what we do is just simply go with the gospel, right, and tell them. And so what I just simply try to do and say, God, by your, by your grace, I'm going <clears> to <throat> tell as many people how they can know for sure that they're going to heaven when they die. And I mentioned those people just a few moments ago, but listen, we're not in it for numbers, we're for people, because the Bible says that God cares about the unrighteous people, how they can go to heaven. A couple weeks ago, August 8th, August 9th, Marcus, Kobe, Julian, Diego, and Jose are born in the end tracks for mm -hmm. Just tell them what the gospel is. Right after church Sunday night, I have to get my sweet tea fixed after church. Amen. Go over there and come. August 10th, Jacob at Walmart, right there by our church. He was, uh, believe it or not, he was getting ready to go down to Socorro, New Mexico, which uh, is our, our college down there. He was leaving the very next day to go down there. I got run right into him and give him the gospel. This stuff happens all the time if you're faithful to go with the gospel. Monica, we have a faith-based addiction at our church that I run. And Monica uh, showed up about 45 minutes late, fought right, literally just fell right into our lap. Afterwards, got to tell her about the gospel, and she got more than did. Praise the Lord. August the 15th, Amanda, uh, our waiter at uh, Rancher Grill, got to say, well, I was preaching two weeks ago down in Dimming, New Mexico. And afterwards, I preached like an hour, just like I kind of always do. 
what to eat. You've got to eat after church too, right? <laughs> Go there. We, we eat. It was about 9 or so o'clock at night. Nobody was there. It was just me and my friend, Brother Garth, who was my partner. And uh, we go up to the front and check out. And I said, hey, I just want to give this to you. This is, this is not my church. This is the church that, we're, that i got to preach at today. I said, man, there are some verses how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. And I, nobody was there. We took about 20 minutes sitting right there right after she closed this out for good. I thought, I'm sure how she can get saved and how she can get born again. It's just that simple. Listen, we don't have to complicate things. We don't have to make it difficult. We just got to present it. And persuade. The Bible says, "No one therefore the terrible war we persuade them in." And we just tell them, and then they have to make our decision. I wish, I wish we could say, "You're going to get sick." I wish that was impossible. Too. <laughs> Everybody would get sick. I wish it was, but it's not how that happens, right? Uh, on August the twentieth, Kevin, Erica, Fernando, Oscar got saved. I uh, got a meeting for at a park by our church. It's uh, Pat Hurley Park. It overlooks all of Albuquerque. Man, beautiful. A lot of kids go there to get in trouble, but I messed up their little bit of trouble making nothing. They just came yeah. there with the gospel. I knew what they were doing. They were getting ready to smoke some, uh, some, smoke some marijuana, saw them roll it, walked up right to them and said, hey, I'm going to give you a gospel track. Let me give you a bite to church. They were awkward. But then I started talking to them. Man, the, like, the girl they, there, Erica, she was under so much conviction. She started crying. She said, I'm going to die into the hell. I got a lot of sin in my life. I, I'm doing drugs here, so I'm doing this. I used to give it all that up. Ooh, yeah, you do. She got saved. Praise, Praise the Lord. Salvation, seeing people saved, is a miracle. We ask, where are the only miracles? Why, why did God do something? Because we messed up way back here. We're not heeding the direction to go. And as soon as we go, God will take care of the rest. The results are left up to him. So I brought this up about, and I read that list of for a reason. This is my challenge for you. I told Brother Grant, I'm going to really challenge you guys. Again, I'm not a numbers guy, but all the resources of heaven are available to those that take a step of faith. And this will take a step of faith for some of us. This month, during September, why don't you pray and ask God that you can be, not individually, but as a church, be 25 people to the Lord. As a church, everybody. And listen, it's, it will not be a loss if you saw one, people, one person say it. It would be a loss. You by any stretch of, made, uh, of the imagination, it would be a loss at all. But you're just stepping out by faith saying, God, I just want to see somebody say I just want to see somebody say He said, oh, well, I don't think that many people can say Listen, he, the Bible says, they have sown tears shall reap in joy. He that go forth and reap and bearing precious seeds shall doubtless, doubtless come again with rejoicing, bring a sheep with him. You know our biggest problem is we're messing up right there. We're not heeding and listening to the simple, clear instruction. Look up here, look up. The cl clear, simple instruction of go ye to all the world. That's where we're at. Some of us have never, have never given an invitation to our church. Never given an invitation to our church. Now I have to say this, shame on you. Shame on you. You're glad that you have a church that you get to go. You're glad that you're going to heaven when you die. You're glad that God's working a miracle in your life and changed you so much. And listen, there's some of you I know pretty well. Some of us were a rough, rough group of people before we got saved. Some of us, I got saved when I was four years old. Understand that, man, I was a sinner. I was going to die in the hell. And I felt like I was going to go to hell that very moment. I didn't get saved out of a rough life. God kept me from a rough life. I'm so thankful that I'm going to heaven. For 23 years now, I've been saved, born again, going to heaven when I die. And it's my responsibility, listen now, it's my responsibility, not as a preacher, but as a child of God, Amen. to tell other people how to go to heaven. Listen, it's not the pastor's job to show up on Saturday morning to go with the gospel. It's the Christian's job. It's the child of God's job. Now, just to give you this last word, and we're done. John Hyde, known as Praying Hyde, was an amazing man. I believe he went over to India as well. <clears throat> he was in a in a uh, at a college, and he had a man from India come and basically do kind of like mission missions emphasis at the college, and he preached about going with the gospel. He was convicted, and he went to his roommate and he said, "Man, I, I think God's going to want me to go to the foreign field." And the, he said to his roommate, "He said, tell me all the reasons why I should go to the foreign field." The roommate had so much wisdom. He said. You know, you know as many of the reasons or the arguments to why you should go as much as I do. Why don't you just get on your knees and 
and ask God and let God sell. For the first time in John Hyde's life, he prayed through the night. He woke up, got up off his knees the next morning, went to his roommate, roommate and said, it's settled. I'm going to India. Spent the last couple of, couple of years there in college and really just tried to preach about going all around the world. And you've seen a lot of people saved there at the college as well. Seven different men got called to the mission field, one of them being C.T. Stutt, a great right. Baptist preacher. Right. Long story short, goes over to India, and man, he is just there laboring, kind of like William Carey, just laboring, not seeing anybody say it. Laboring, not seeing anybody say it. Getting really discouraged. Very, really discouraged. And he said that he's, he finally, after I think it was about five years of not seeing anybody say it, finally got to see his first conference. And man, he was so excited. Praying for about somebody who important and so excited about it. It just felt like God was leading him in this direction. So he started praying. And after about two weeks, sold time of getting to see that first one saved. And during those first two weeks of after that first one, led about three more people to war. Just really excited. And he said, man, I believe this is what God wants me to do. And he started praying that God will help him to see somebody saved every day. Just pray every day, every day, every day. That God will help him see somebody saved every day. <coughs> start praying that. Start asking God to God help him see somebody saved every day. Every day. The first year he baptized over 400 converts. The second year we had so much faith in this. We said, okay, God, I don't want to just see one person saved. I want to see two people saved every day. Just two people saved every day. That year he baptized over 800 converts. And he kept going up. He went to, I think it was about four people a day, some, some miraculous number like that. Just, I want to see some people say it. And add to the church, baptized. And he, this, he, didn't, he didn't count them unless they got baptized. That's what's crazy. We count them. We're all about numbers. That's baptized people. They didn't count unless they got baptized. Man, just went every day, every day, every day. The natives gave him the, the title, Praying High. And that was because this is the same that they said. He prayed by night. And witness right now. You just pray and ask God to work. Pray and ask God to work and then we get the work. Now, starting here in a couple days, you're going to have a prayer meeting in the morning and then you're going to have an opportunity to go. Let's use that principle there. Praying and going. Praying and going. Our goal, all it is, is to glorify God and to simply obey Him. That's our goal. Glorify God and obey Him. That's all it is. But we need to pray and see this place. Let's end with that. Can you ever have God every eye closed? God worked a miracle here, not because of anything special that the servants did. We can look at that when we have time to. Not because of anything like that, but simply because they just listened to what Jesus said. And God worked a miracle. And for you and I, listen, seeing people say it is a miracle. It is such a blessing to be able to see people say it. And that's our responsibility. God's given us the command. And all we have to do is simply obey. And so what I'd like for you to do, if you would, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and always look around. How many of you feel like you need to be more faithful to give the gospel? I'm not saying, I'm not saying go win the world. I'm just saying just give the gospel. Tell somebody how they can know and see if they accept. How many of you say, I need to do better at that? Would you raise your hand? I need to do better at that. Listen, this is a great week. You guys are about to be instructed and encouraged with how to tell people about sin, how, how they can get saved. And then he does not get the same. Okay, this is step one, this is step two. He's just going to give you some principles. He's going to show you how you can lead somebody to the Lord. Listen, you're going to learn this month. And it's so exciting. How many of you say that I need to be a part of something, uh, at least a couple of these this month? And just say, I'm going to do my best to see some people say this month during this great emphasis. Hands, if you would. Thank you. Those hands. Now, what I would like for you to do, just again, we're asking God to do something. For those of you that said, I'm going to try to do my best to be a part of something this month. What I'm going to have you do, I'm going to have you stand right now. All, everybody standing. And for those of you that raise your hand, I want you to come forward and say, God, I'm just going to make a commitment to you. I'm going to give the gospel. For those of you that raise your hand and say, I need to be more faithful, and I'm going to do it this month. Would you come and, and pray and ask God? Just seal with the Lord. This is nothing for show. This is just making a commitment for God. This month, I want to see God use me 